East Carolina University, we have Dr. Daryl Newford. Please join me in welcoming him. In 1814, a young 16-year-old girl was traveling through Europe with three companions of hers. And like many teenagers of the day, they were interested in the paranormal. And one of their favorite topics was the topic known as galvanism. Galvanism derives from a, a scientist named Luigi Galvani, who had discovered about 20 years earlier in the 1780s and 90s that if you applied an electrical impulse to a frog corpse, that the legs would contract. Now, this actually, for scientists, this represents the beginning of electrophysiology and neuroscience. But to the young teenagers, this represented a uh, sort of an occult idea and bringing to life organisms using electricity. Now, the, the uh, four companions late one night decided they were going to have a competition to see who could write the best horror story. So Mary Shelley set about her task of writing a horror story. It took her about a year and a half. By the time she was 18, she submitted it anonymously, and by the time she was 20, it was published. The story was Frankenstein. I'm sure you all are familiar with it. It was based on a young doctor who brought uh, inanimate objects, or an inan inanimate uh, human uh, to life using electricity. And of course, it's been adapted into a number of movies. The most recent, I think, is uh, coming out in a couple of weeks. So what I want you to consider today is that life actually does emanate from the flow of electricity and that metabolic diseases arrive, or arise from disruptions in the flow of that electricity. And so to put some context into it, uh, I want you to think or consider a cell that has all of the parts that are needed to make that cell alive, but it, what, does it, what does it need to transfer into something that is living? So most of you are aware, I'm sure, that there are, uh, what it would need would be energy charge, including uh, some form of energy that the cell can use, as well as an electrical charge. So our story begins today and on this planet uh, with the molecule oxygen. Oxygen sits at number eight on the periodic table, which means, and I also want to point out that what's below it, sulfur. Keep that in mind, because that'll come up later in the presentation. Now, oxygen, oxygen has atomic number eight, which means it has eight protons and eight electrons orbiting that nucleus. Now, those electrons, if you remember back to high school chemistry, they uh, circle and are organized in orbitals, which are much more difficult to draw than, than my artistic capabilities, but they're represented there. And each electron has a, a spin of its own, it's called a spin resonance. And so the way the electrons like to organize themselves in the orbitals is to have uh, two electrons uh, with opposite spins organized in progressively, uh, progressively increasing orbitals away from the nucleus. So you'll see that the first orbital has two electrons, the 2s orbital is filled, and then you get to the 2p orbital, and there are two unpaired electrons with the same spin resonance. Now, on this planet, you can't, you can't generate a more um, molecule that has more of an attraction for electrons. It is always looking for more electrons. Now, an oxygen atom doesn't exist on the planet because it's not stable as such. And so the easiest thing for nature to do is simply combine two oxygen atoms to form an oxygen molecule where they are sharing those unpaired electrons. The other easy thing to do is to take hydrogen, which atomic number one, and put two hydrogens there, they share the electrons, and presto, you have water. All of metabolism is built, built on this very basic chemistry. So um, galvanism uh, can be redefined as the induction of electrical current between two chemicals differing with electronegativities. What does that mean? Well, we in all intuitively understand that if you move a stronger magnet closer to a weaker magnet, it will attract a piece of iron. We could also classify those as a stronger donor and a weaker donor. If the weaker magnet has the piece of iron attached to it, and we've assigned units to these magnets, then we have a difference in potential energy of nine units, 
Why is that important? Well, because we can get work. We can do work out of that potential energy difference. With molecules or um, uh, chemicals, we, we talk in terms of couples, whether the molecule or atom has, um, has the electron associated with it or with it doesn't. And what we really want to know as biochemists is can we assign a number? Can we assign a magnetic strength to that molecule? So these experiments were done um, by biochemists in the 1950s, and what they do is create a reaction with the simplest redox couple, which is the hydrogen ion redox couple, and compare that with oxygen, connect them with the wire, and when you do that, oxygen pulls electrons from the hydrogen and it registers with a voltmeter of about 816 millivolts. Very positive, very attractive. Another redox couple that's common in biology is an NAD-NADH redox couple, and you'll see that it is less attractive for electrons than the hydrogen, and so hydrogen actually takes electrons away from the NADH-NAD redox couple. Okay, well, let's jump forward a little bit. So if we consider the oxidation of a, a simple sugar molecule and we send it through the factories that the cell has to metabolize it through glycolysis and TCA cycle, by the time we get through all those chemical reactions, CO2, six molecules of CO2 have been produced, which you exhale, and a little bit of energy has been generated. But what's left over are 16 hydrogen molecules, which the easy thing for nature to have done would be to simply combine those with oxygen to form water, but the ingenious thing that's done is that the hydrogens are combined and captured by NIDH and carried to the mitochondria where there's an electrical current that is set up. And the advantage of this is that it represents between NADH and oxygen over a volt of potential energy that the mitochondria is going to use to generate about 26 to 30 more ATP molecules. So we'll focus a little bit on this intermitochondrial membrane. It's a membrane that is composed of various different proteins. The electron transport system, is, as it's known, transports electrons by default. Why is that? Because it's simply a series of magnets, each progressing to a stronger magnet, with oxygen sitting at the end, the ultimate electron magnet. So electron flow is always towards oxygen. The second point to make before we start this process is that electron flow cannot occur without proton pumping, and proton pumping cannot occur with ele without electron flow. So if we were starting from scratch and we added fuel, which is the NADH, what happens? Well, electrons start pumping. Protons or hydrogen ions start uh, being, uh, uh, or electrons start flowing. Protons start pumping. Oxygen starts being uh, consumed. And you can imagine that as the protons begin to build up on the outer surface of that membrane, it creates a back pressure on the pumps. And eventually, the system reaches the point where the back pressure is so high that it completely opposes further actions of the pump. The system at this point is not broken. It's simply reached a static head. We can, in the lab, actually measure that static head, which up in the upper right is a potentiometer showing the membrane potential at its maximum and electron flow at its lowest point. Mitochondria never do this in vivo because they are slightly leaky. The membrane is slightly leaky to protons. Now recognize what that means. It means that now electrons can start flowing. It means that the membrane potential has dropped a little bit. It means that oxygen can start being consumed again. Basically, it's the way to get the system going again. If there's another protein inserted into the membrane that allows protons to flow through back into the matrix, like the ATP synthase, then the system starts running faster. But the point in going through this is to, is to demonstrate that the system is primed, ready to respond to demand. Now we need to cover one more thing. If we were starting from scratch with a cell that has low ATP levels and we want to bring ATP levels up, you can imagine that ATP would start climbing and climbing and climbing. But that would also create a back pressure on the ATP synthase. And so as the system continues to climb, the membrane potential starts to uh, rise, electron flow starts to decrease, and oxygen consumption starts to decrease until the system reaches uh, another static head. 
At this point, there's a ratio of about uh, 1,000 to 1 of ATP to ATP. This is how energetically the cell brings itself to life. The, this ATP to ADP gradient is what is used by all of the systems that are listed there to support a cell energetically. Now, by now, you should be recognizing that there are a couple of regulators on this system. What's one? One is the rate of ATP utilization, because that determines the rate at which protons are coming through the ATP synthase. The second regulator is the membrane potential, because that's regulating the rate at which electrons are flowing through the system, and therefore the rate at which electrons are being pulled through the pathways of metabolism. The key to the whole system is the fact that oxygen is always yanking on electrons, always wanting it. This would be an open circuit, except for the fact that it has these two regulators associated with it. But really, what we're talking about is a biological electrical circuit, extending all the way back up to the food that we eat, the electrons flowing through all those pathways, and eventually throwing, uh, flowing through to this system. Now, this is a pressurized system, meaning that when the system is working at its slowest, that's when there is the most electrons within the system, because there's oxygen always around. Those electrons have the potential to leak to oxygen prematurely to form superoxide, the parent molecule of all reactive oxygen species, and that's converted to H2O2, which we'll talk about in a second. So the point being that uh, mitochondria are always idling or consuming energy. It takes fuel. The way the system is supposed to work is in between meals, we tap into fuel, the, uh, those fuel reserves, and then we eat to replenish those reserves. The problem is that we're now in a society where people are eating and the reserves are already replete, and it puts a nutritional overload on the system. The result is that too much H2O2 is being released, and it signals to the cell to decrease insulin sensitivity. Another way to view this is shown here, what I've, done, what I've done is put the mitochondrial membrane potential on the left y-axis, and what might a person, and the dotted line is the membrane potential at which electrons will start to leak and H2O2 start to be produced. A sedentary person that wakes up in the middle, of the, or wakes up, has donuts, goes to work, sits in front of their computer, has big lunch, goes back to their computer, goes home, eats dinner, they spend the entire day under pressure and above the dotted line. You contrast that with a person that is in caloric balance, gets a little bit of exercise and activity during the day, and they spend most of the day below the dotted line. So this is the classic figure of the energy cycle of life. In fact, to paraphrase the great Mufasa, this completes the metabolic circle of life. But there's one more component that we are going to talk about, and that takes us back to the mitochondrial inner membrane and a protein known as nicotinamide nucleotide transhydrogenase, which uses the membrane potential to drive the production of NADPH, again generating ex an extremely high level, and that ratio of NADPH to NADP serves as a generator to distribute electrons. Where are those electrons going? Well, our proteome inside the cell contains 22,000 of these redox-sensitive sulfur residues that can exist either as an oxidized or a reduced species. Because we live on a planet where oxygen is the default state and oxid oxidation is the default state, to bring a cell to life requires the generation of electrical circuit to reduce those uh, redox sensitive thiols. In fact, the cell moves, if you're starting from scratch, from 100% reduced or oxidized to 90% reduced. It's like turning on a light bulb inside the cell. In fact, it's like turning on thousands and thousands of light bulbs. Although we didn't know it at the time when George Bush talked about uh, a thousand points of light, this is exactly what he was talking about. Now the redox circuit completes uh, around to re regenerate NADP, and the interesting thing is that the H2O2 coming out of the mitochondria is a regulator of this circuit because it is buffered by the same system. It short circuits the system. And if there's nutritional overload and the battery then 
senses that overload, it produces more H2O2, more short circuiting of the circuit, dimming of light bulbs, and this is associated with the progression of various diseases. In fact, this system is going to be the topic of research for the next 50 to 100 years. So your take home points are that oxygen is the yanker of electrons from the food we eat. It generates a membrane potential, which is used to generate an energy charge and an electrical charge that brings the human being to life. H2O2 regulates that electrical charge, but this presents for oxygen the remarkable yin yang of oxygen. First, we all understand that oxygen is essential for life, but it's ironic that also oxidation is our ultimate demise on this planet. And life for cells is all about avoiding becoming oxidized. Thank you. Great job. Great job, Dr. Newfer. Thank you for starting us off so well. So we've got um, a couple of questions here. Uh, Mike R. from the University of Tennessee wants to know, is a molecule considered oxidized if there is a great difference in polarity? Uh, only if it's uh, subject to reversible oxidation. Pol molecules can have polarity and not change their redox state. The polarity can come about by other means. Hmm. So how does this change? Um, it, it's interesting that we, you and I have been in this business for a while, and very rarely do we talk about electrical potential when we talk about metabolic flux. Mm -hmm. So how does this change the conversation around mitochondrial biogenesis and uh, things like obesity and a variety of other things that deal with mitochondrial dysfunction? Yeah, so I know this is a sports medicine meeting, so the, the, the or a, a sports medicine institute, it should be obvious from this that how do you take the pressure off the system? The easiest way is to step on the gas, even just a little bit. We'll take complete pressure off the mitochondria because you're accelerating those protons and the rate at which they come back in. You, you completely remove the H2O2 production. And that's why we think exercise is so healthy um, because it takes the pressure off the system if the person has put themselves under pressure. So, don't eat too many electrons and make sure your protons are flowing. So look for the electron content of your food. <laughs> yeah, well. <Yeah. laughs> so join me in thanking Dr. Newfer for his talk. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.